as you know, California began as a frontier state. And with the population that settled California, it wasn't a terribly professionalized population. It was miners and those who were here to support miners. And just like every other community and every other civilization, California had people with developmental disabilities living uh, in its population. And it wasn't long, it was really the mid to late 1800s that the state began to contemplate how should we provide treatment and care to this population that needed assistance? So in the late 1800s, the state opened its first developmental center. And up until the 1960s, that was really the model of care. It was a medical model of care that focused on providing care and supervision to meet individual needs. And that's how we continued on until the mid-1960s. But by the 1960s, California had over 13,000 individuals with developmental disabilities in these institutional settings. And there were thousands more on the waiting list for admission. At this time, there weren't options aside from institutional care. So if a family had a child born with a disability, they were given really two options. The first was to place their child into a developmental center. And the second option was really to care for that child 24 seven on their own. There weren't a lot of social systems in place at the time to, uh, to provide support to the family. In fact, children at this time with disabilities weren't even entitled to, special, to edu public education. The 1960s were an integral time in the field of treatment of individuals with disabilities, both nationally and here in California. John F. Kennedy was president of the United States and he had a sister with a developmental disability. And his other sister, Eunice Shriver Kennedy, began the national dialogue and drew attention to the issue of individuals with developmental disabilities. In a 1963 speech, President John F. Kennedy said that in caring for individuals with disabilities, we have to offer, offer something more than crowded custodial care in our state institutions. And that began a dialogue at the national level. Now at this time, the federal government would participate in the funding for services provided in institutional medical uh, models, but not in, for community services. And so there was the beginning of a, an important conversation in this field. If you want more information about, um, about this movement as a, at a national level, there is a uh, film that is available. It's a brief film uh, that tracks this uh, and really traces the dialogue that, uh, that President Kennedy began. And um, it's available online. And I'll be happy to send that information out following the webinar. So that's what was happening at a national level. In California, there was a very concerted effort around what to do to support individuals with developmental disabilities. And it really was led by families who had children with developmental disabilities. So on the right hand side, you see a graphic um, with lots of pictures on it. And this is the cover from a um, booklet that's available online called We're Here to Speak for Justice, Founding California's Regional Centers. And there's an accompanying film that goes on for a little over an hour, maybe an hour and a half, that tells the story of California's regional center system and our community-based service system. And, so I won't go into as much detail as that film, of course, but I did want to give you some high points. So some of the things that happened were three parents and a reporter for the Orange County Register visited Fairview State Hospital in the early 1960s. 
And they took a look at the institutional model of care and they began to ask questions about if that was the most appropriate way to care for individuals with developmental disabilities. And if maybe we could begin to explore other alternatives. So this visit and the subsequent story in the Orange County Register led to hearings and investigations. And a group of parents organized around this issue and began to demand other options. And they began to, for lack of a better term, hound their elected officials here in Sacramento. And the one that they spent the most time and energy on and that ultimately yielded results was a gentleman by the name of Assemblymember Frank D. Lannerman. Now, Mr. Lannerman, he is pictured on the upper left um, of, that, of that group of pictures. Mr. Lannerman was an assembly member who was a conservative Republican who believed that um, less government was better and who also believe that public-private partnerships really could do a lot of the work that government had done to this point. And those points will become important later. So one of the first things that happened was there was the demand for a report to be written. That's what we do here in Sacramento when there's an issue presented, the problem is studied, and then there's a report generated. And so in 1965, a report summed up the issue and said, the heart of the problem is that most families who are unable to care for their intellectually disabled child at home have no choice other than to place the child in a state hospital. So as I mentioned earlier, there really was, it really was a forced choice. You, the family had the choice of either placing their child in a developmental center, or they had the choice of caring for that child almost entirely on their own. So following the report, there was the decision to create two pilot regional centers. In 1966, the first two regional centers were opened, the first in Los, in Los Angeles and the other in San Francisco. And the goal was to begin to explore alternatives to institutional care to meet each person's unique needs. We were beginning to understand that people and their families have different needs, even people who have the same diagnosis or the same diagnoses have unique needs because of their communities as well as their families. And in 1968, a study found that the two pilot regional centers had been successful. They had been able to provide families with the level of support they needed in order to maintain their children in the community rather than in an institutional setting and at a far lesser cost. So the parent advocates went back to assembly member Lannerman who introduced AB 225 in 1969 which was the vehicle that was used to expand the regional center statewide. As I mentioned earlier, um, Mr. Lannerman was a fan of public-private partnerships, and um, this partnership and this notion really created the regional center system and created services that allowed for uh, regional centers to reflect the needs of each community and to fill the gaps in existing services and supports for each individual family. So having worked at both Central Valley as well as Alta California Regional Center, so Central Valley uh, centered in Fresno and the greater Fresno area, as well as Alta California Regional Center centered in Sacramento and the surrounding area, I can tell you that the challenges for each center are different. Uh, Central Valley is very rural for the most part, and you know one of the big considerations is in have in how to move people from one place to another to receive the appropriate supports. So on a daily basis, how to get someone from home to uh, maybe their work site, and in Alta California catchment area, as well as some other more expensive areas of the state, there are additional challenges related to 
how services are funded as well as um, how to provide services in a more urban setting. So in 1978, the expansion of the regional center system was completed and the 21st regional center opened. At that time, the expectation was that for every million Californians, there would be a new regional center opened. Um, today, we have about 39 million regional, I'm sorry, we have about 39 million Californians, which would mean that today we'd, we would have 39 regional centers, but we decided to stop at 21. And so those boundaries have remained relatively similar for the last uh, almost 40 years. So additional important developments in the system. In 1973, um, again, Assemblymember Lannerman wrote legislation to expand the services of regional centers to individuals with other developmental disabilities other than intellectual disability. And so there were opportunities for people who had cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism, and other conditions closely related to intellectual disability to join the regional center system. In 1983, California began to receive federal funding for its community-based system. This was a huge deal, and we'll talk more about what federal dollars mean to us today. But up until that point, almost the entire system was funded on entirely state dollars. Another huge development for us was in 1985. There was a lawsuit that really stemmed from a California fiscal crisis. And at that time, the question that was raised was in case of fiscal crisis, can the services that individuals receive through the regional centers be scaled back in response to that crisis? And what the California Supreme Court said was that the Lanterman Act, quote, defines a basic right and corresponding basic obligation. The right which it grants to the developmentally disabled person is to be provided with services that enable him to live in a more live a more independent and productive life in the community. The obligation which it imposes on the state is to provide such services. And this really established the entitlement to services that we know today. And the entitlement to services in California is one of the things that we're very proud of. We are the only state that has that will provide needed developmental services to any resident of our state regardless of eligibility for medical known as medicaid in other states and without a waiting list in some states in the country the wait for services can exceed a decade so this was an essential piece of what made us what we are today Additional developments um, in 1993 in what was known as the Caulfield Settlement forced the state and the state agreed to um, begin a larger scale movement of individuals from developmental centers into the community. In fact, more than 2,000 people were moved from state run developmental centers to the community over a five year period. And since that time, we've seen the closure of several of the remaining developmental centers. 